Hit it, Phil. Da, 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 da. Can it be the breeze that fills the trees with rare and magic perfume? Oh, no. <laughs> it isn't the breeze. It's Jackson time. La, da, da, da. Well, hello again. This is Buck Benny speaking. I am joined with John Henderson. It's just the two of us today, which I always think is kind of fun when it's the two of us. We both do Jack Benny podcasts. His day, his podcast is This Day in Jack Benny, which is just a phenomenal podcast that you need to listen to. And we coordinate it so that we never, you're never going to hear the same episodes back and forth. He stays away from the years that I do and, and he covers the other years and uh, he just does a fine job. We we do what two I guess four episodes of Jack a week, sort of two presentations each with two each, and then John does one a week. So I mean, you could listen to to both, and and it, it, it's great. Anyway, uh, tonight's episodes we're going to get into is a 1947 Jack Benny episode, of course, and we'll again on YouTube you'll be able to see both of us. And then you'll be able to see the script synced up so that you can actually follow along with the script, the actual script. This is not just the words I'm typing in or something. This is photocopies that they have of the script. The uh, tobacco companies had to put out all the scripts because they had to put out all the documentation that they ever did. And so Jack's scripts got dumped on the internet that way from 1944 to 1955, I guess, were the tobacco years. So all that stuff's out there. And so anyway, I, I just thought for you guys to experience that on YouTube would be kind of cool. And then we'll, uh, then we always follow that up with the, the Phil Harris show from the same date as the, from the same date in 1947. And then we'll hop back 10 years and get the uh, Jack Benny show from 1937. This week's episode from 37 has Burns and Allen on it. I love it when Burns and Allen on it. We'll go more into that in a few minutes, but We'll start off with the 1947 episode that, that you'll hear first or see first. And uh, John, why don't you talk about yeah. that or last week's episode or whatever you want to chat about. I'm amazed how I can keep listening to Jack Benny and never get tired of it. I'm always worried, you know, at a certain point, it's going to lose the magic for me. And so I try to avoid, you know, listening to the same episode over and over again. I've heard these episodes and they're just as funny the second time or the third time as they were the first time. Uh, it's, you know, maybe, maybe it's, this is a particularly good season, but I loved last week's episode. This week's episode takes off right from that. Last week, Jack Benny visited the, uh, the movie producer, Samuel Goldwyn, and yes. it was so funny. He's like, oh, I'm here to talk about a picture. And the, the receptionist gives him a headshot. And he's like, oh, no, <laughs> not that kind of picture. <laughs> I want to talk about making a movie. Uh, and so it's just so much fun to hear, you know, Sam Goldwyn, to hear Jack Benny in this, you know, it's, it's a continuing uh, arc, but also... You don't have to have heard the last episode to hear the next episode. Correct. It's so great that Jack Benny, you can either listen to in order or at random order, and it's just as funny. Um, so last week, and I was wondering if you maybe had any insight on this, Dar Dar I have very little insight, but I'll, I'll see. <laughs> I'll dig into my insight barrel and see if I have something in there. <laughs> There's a hilarious bit that I don't know if I'm missing something or if it's just what it is. So... He's at the studio. Yes. And people are passing by. They're like, oh, good morning, Mr. Benny. Hello, yes. Mr. Benny. And then he's like, gosh, aren't those Goldwyn girls beautiful? So yes. we hear men's voices, and then he says they're the Goldwyn girls. Yes. Now, am I am I missing something about yes. that? Or is it just okay? You tell You're me. You're missing something, and so am I. So I don't know, <laughs> but it's got to be something about well i th i think i i think what it is is the goldwyn girls were definitely these dancers and things that he featured in his films i mean certainly i i think all of those like the it's uh, like a chorus line basically. yeah yeah like a beautiful chorus line yeah and i think the joke is very simply that all these guys are talking to him and but it's but then the joke is this has really been the the girls the golden girls that have been talking to him this whole time and so you're like oh so these girls that we never hear talk and we just see them dancing all the time right or whatever that that they all have these ma masculine voices and things and so that's supposed to be the joke and and it is kind of funny but it is again like the moose in the hat rack joke we talked about last week that it's it, you got to think about it for a second what what's going on here and then it 
kind of is funny after the fact, but I don't know if in the moment your your brain connects all that together or not. Yeah, well, for me, it sort of works the opposite, where it's like these guys are passing by, you know, something's coming, they're building to something, yes. and then when he says the Goldwyn Girls, I had this like it was so surprising that I laughed. I had this visceral sort of like hilarious, shocked surprise. So it worked. So it worked. <laughs> it worked. But then when I thought and I thought about it, I'm like, what? Wait, what does that mean? Why? why? <laughs> So, well, hey, whatever, whatever works. Whatever so, works. That's exactly what it is with the yeah. Jack show. It's whatever works. I love it. Yeah. But also last week, uh, Hoagie Carmichael said, you know, oh, they, Sam Goldwyn called me Hugo Carmichael. Got my name wrong. Yeah. I'm just a poor guy with a million dollars. And yeah. Jack Betty goes, whoops. Yeah. When he says million. And yes. so they continue that gag. They do that, you know, two or three times in the last episode. Whenever he says million dollars, it's like, yep. whoops. And so uh, in this episode, they continue that. And I think it's it's done really well as a, oh, an yeah. ongoing gag. Well, the last episode, the part I loved was when, uh, it, and we decided uh, that it was actually um, Mel Blanc that's talking to mm -hmm. Samuel Goldwyn at that point and doing a straight Mel Blanc, which you never hear. So go back and listen to that if you haven't heard last week's episode. But anyway, so he he says, "Oh, we can uh, we can do this. We, we're trying to do this scene in one of your movies, and we can do it two ways. We can spend a million dollars, and then Jack goes whoops, and then, or we can spend two million dollars, and Jack goes whoops, and then he presents it. He says it again. The choices uh -huh. or whatever, or, or Samuel Goldwyn goes over it, and he says, "Well, we could do the one million, and Jack says whoops, or we could do the two million, and Jack goes whoops, whoops, yeah. and so he does it <laughs> twice, and, and it's just." funny that he does that and and samuel goldwyn is pointing it out too is what, what's going on jack you sound like what does he say he sounds like he sounds like something anyway but it was oh yeah like a tugboat like a tugboat that's yeah. right that's right and so that was cute i mean that whole piece is so cute and then the the other piece that i didn't share last week but we're going to go ahead and spoil it for you was the uh was jack saying he has hidden talents and and samuel goldwyn's answer is so beautiful it's like it's like i don't have time to play hide and seek now jack to try and yeah. find your hidden talent, you know? So it's like, I just thought that was such a well-written and the way he delivered it was so spot on. Um, yeah, yeah. That's, that's just a great bit. Yeah. This so, week, um, I want to throw out one thing that's on this episode. We have, um, you know, Dennis's bit where Dennis does his whole um, O thing uh, where he thinks of something after the fact uh, that, that he should have done, right? Yeah. And, and, they, and, he, and we've seen that, we've heard that. This one actually had me laugh out loud because it was such a different one. I'm not going to give it away, but it has to do with baseball. And and the part of this episode is, is about baseball and so forth. And so that comes up. Um, also, the Sportsman's song in this is is one of their better songs. I really enjoy that they do the baseball song thing. And and that's really enjoyable in this episode as well. Yeah, John, well, like, with, go ahead. With, with the, you know, the thing about Dennis doing these similar jokes, but they change it you know, sometimes where it's really interesting and surprising. Yes. And you'll notice that if you listen to a lot of Jack Benny, where sometimes they'll redo whole episodes, but more often than not, they'll take this piece and they'll pull it out and use it again. And in this episode, there's a part where Jack Benny gets shocked and yeah. they'll, like, electrical shocked. And yes. they'll use that again in a, a Christmas 1949 episode, which is also very funny. Yes. So it's, it's almost just, done better than this one. Yeah, uh, I think but so. that's so often the case. J J they'll do a bit, and they'll say, that was kind of funny, and it kind of worked. Let's do it again. But then they think it through, and they make it a little better. It's like you're constantly fine-tuning and fine-tuning. I mean, you get that with certainly the, the Christmas shopping episodes get sharper and sharper as they go, and they keep the bits that work the best, and they fine-tune those bits. But it's not just that. It's all the bits that they 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 don't just let things stand they often go back and revisit things and and tighten them up a little more and so i, I think that's why so many people think the later seasons are so funny because they're building on things that they've the yeah. jokes that they've fine-tuned over the last 10 years they've done it three or four times and by the time they they're doing it in 47 all of 47 48 49 they're really tuned in also yeah, the writers even... were bringing so much more to the plate at this time, uh, this time frame is like right after they introduced Professor LeBlanc. He's been introduced maybe a couple years before this. The the uh, the Coleman's have started appearing more regularly. 
that they started just a couple of years before this. So much, they introduced so many new concepts in 45, 46, and 47, 48, 49, they fine tune all those concepts they've introduced. The vault was introduced and all that. Anyway, go ahead, John. You were going to say, well, oh, just the gonna, Maxwell too. Yeah. The, the television show oftentimes is the best of the radio show. You know, the best yes. episode of the television show is when they take the best parts of the radio show and they move them over to television. I, I was going to mention on my podcast, like you said, I, I, I look for the things that you wouldn't get. Mm -hmm. uh, and in this one, there's an interesting one, which is uh, the phonograph. You know, they're listening to the phonograph. And then Jack Benny says, the horn and the dog. And I don't know if you've ever seen a record and uh, yeah. the labels at that time would have that picture of a dog listening to a phonograph. Yes. So that's a reference to the picture. You look that look up at almost any record around this time. Right. And you'll see that symbol. Sure. And just the fact that at this point in time, he would still have a phonograph that has the horn thing that, <laughs> exactly. that, that's connected to it. And by that time, that is old uh, technology and everything. Uh, yeah. It, It'd be like if we were sitting around and watching a black and white 12 inch TV or something in our modern age. I mean, it just is. Or a boom box instead of an iPod or whatever. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and I still got a boom box like in my garage that I listen to. <laughs> anyway, um, no, but uh, funny episodes throughout. The, the Phil Harris, uh, this, I, I've spoken before on this, this season sometimes gets maligned. I, I really think what happened here is, is the whole last half of the season didn't exist or nobody had it, right? It, it wasn't in circulation. So the only things in circulation were like the first 15 episodes or so, and, ha and few of those were missing. They all had pretty bad sound. So I think everybody kind of based their judgment on those and said, oh, Phil got so much better when he switched to Rexall. But I'd say the last half of this season really is getting close to that Rexall sort of quality. And so I'm really enjoying these episodes. Uh, the last one with the, the Easter one where he's, where he's dressed up like the Easter Bunny is so funny. This one's funny. There's so much, and there's so much more um, interaction with his daughters because they haven't quite gotten down that thing of where it's pretty much his and Elliot Lewis's show. And it's those two guys and everybody else is just background sort of characters in a way. At this point, they didn't know exactly where they were going, so you'd feature his daughters more, you'd feature guest performances more, you'd have Alice gets bigger parts in a lot of these episodes. So I just think they're interesting for sure to listen to. And um, uh, Shampoo is the perfect sponsor for the Phil Harris show. Because yes. you, can, you can imagine Alice Faye using Fit Shampoo, but you can also imagine Phil Harris <laughs> yes. you know, getting those gorgeous locks from the Fit Shampoo. <laughs> Oh, for sure. For sure. And just letting the Phil Harris character shine for a whole episode versus, you know, the two minutes he gets on Jack's show is just charming. And I, I just don't think these shows get as much love as they should, maybe. And uh, I, they are one of the strongest when you hear modern on audiences listen to old time radio shows and, and hear which ones they, they gravitate towards. I'd say, you know, Jack's show is very popular, you know, but uh, Phil's is almost even more popular. If you've never heard it before and you hear it for the first time, Phil's shows are funny and they're just really, really good. I probably hear uh, more comments from new people coming to Old Time Radio about Phil's show, Suspense, and maybe Gunsmoke are the three that kind of people go, whoa, those are just amazing high oh, yeah. quality shows, right? And then Jack's is in there too, you know, but uh, anyway. I would definitely give it a chance. And then let's go to the 37 episode for a minute. Uh, we, we get Burns, Grace, Gracie Allen and George Burns on here. And both of them, you just hear the love and the affection for Jack and for Mary. And just, you can just tell they're friends. And it's just such a, a warm feeling that you have. The other thing that struck me with this one is, so this is 37. So this is a long time ago. And... I swear, George Byrne sounds like he's about 65 in this episode. <laughs> and then you hear George Byrne in the 90s talking or, or doing jokes, and he sounds like he's about 65. Yeah. So, I mean, the guy, his voice just stayed the same for decades and decades and decades. And uh, it's just amazing. Um, and then 
his love for Gracie just comes through so well. And it, it's definitely an entertaining episode. And it's got one of the Buck Benny skits in there. And Andy Devine shows up and just uh, a fun, fun episode all the way around. So I think, I think you'll really enjoy that one as well. So a great night of episodes. Um, John, anything else you want to throw in there? Oh, well, I would, uh, if, since I'm the only one here, I can take an opportunity to do a a, a plug, a promotion uh, of my. Oh, no, no, we got to go now. All right, see you next. <laughs> no. Go ahead, John. No, I've got a really exciting project that I'm doing oh, cool. for my Patreon listeners. Yeah. So people can listen to my podcast for free, no problem, right? Yeah. But if you want to give money, because you're like, I got all this money, I got to give it somewhere. You yeah. can give five dollars a month. <laughs> so many people are having that I problem know. these days with <laughs> prices being so low and gas being so cheap. They could just they, they just got extra money to throw around. It's great. Anyway, yeah. Go ahead, John. So for for five dollars a month on Patreon, you get these bonus episodes. So I'm thinking, oh, what can I do? I, I've got Jack Benny as a guest, but I want to do something different, something I can do consistent consistently, and uh. I thought I have a great idea. Mm -hmm. I'll take Kathy Fuller Seeley's book, Jack Benny and the Golden Age of American Radio Comedy, yeah. and turn it into an audiobook. So I yeah. asked Kathy, she gave me the go ahead, and I got my wife, who is a radio personality, she's a, a beautiful reader, to read a chapter a month for the Patreon. Wow. So I just put out the introduction. So we sort of explain mm -hmm. what we're doing and, and the introduction to the book, the acknowledgments, the introduction. Mm -hmm. And it sounds so great. We just released it. And so I'm really looking forward to chapter one. I'm going to have Kathy on to give, you know, a brief little thing about chapter one. And then we'll go into the audio book of chapter one. It's a little longer than a typical episode. You know, typical Jack Benny episode is half yeah. an hour. The first episode was an hour long. But it's. Uh, I was going to ask how long it takes to read a chapter, so it's about an hour or so. At yeah. least, but I assume it fluctuates because some of the chapters are shorter than other ones. And things. Right. So, yeah. yeah. That's exciting. I want to listen to it now. Yeah. <laughs> I'll have to pay my $5. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but no, that sounds great. And so um, I'll link to that in the show notes, um, both on YouTube and, and my other ones, so that they can get there and, and listen to that if they want to do oh, that that'd be great it, and it's a great book a great read um i mean if you whether you listen to it or get kathy's book to read or both uh it's definitely worth you can get the book and then read along yeah yeah <laughs> i think it's great and then and your wife she does have such a great voice i mean both of you guys i mean yeah um I want yeah, you well, to do I, some I, kind of radio I, I, show. I mean, I know you do podcasts together and things, but I don't know, so, something, because you guys yeah. are so good actors too, so. <laughs> well, I, I just, I like listening to audiobooks, you know, like I, on my own time, I'm listening to some Agatha Christie yeah. mysteries. I love listening to audiobooks. I think a lot of old radio fans are old radio fans because they like to listen to things. So yes. I thought this would be a great way to present that, uh, that book. It is a great way. It's a great, great idea. Um, and, and speaking of John and voices and everything, uh, it, it, this last week was Frank Nelson's birthday. And so uh, a bunch of folks were doing Frank Nelson impressions. Uh, they had, I saw just a video today of, of somebody doing one and, you know, they're okay. They're fine. But every time I listen to them, I think, oh, they're not nearly as good as John. So John <laughs> is such a great Frank Nelson. So I can't wait till we do some more recreations of the Jack Benny uh, missing episodes and things. We do have one that's kind of a little bit finished that needs to, needs to have more of it done. So, well, I, I would assume in the next couple months, we'll probably do that. It's just hard to fit everything in. And, and just so folks kind of know what's going on with, with me and everything, um, it's, it's just been a crazy year and my dad's like in the hospital and there's just a lot of things going on. So um, I'm not as consistent in my podcasts and things. It's becoming, I, I'm kind of copying John and it's becoming more of a once a week sort of thing instead of a daily thing like it used to be. But I'm sure I'll be doing it more often as I go and things. So. Well, I think I, as a listener, you know, when you're the person creating the podcast, yeah. you're hyper aware of all these things, release times and, yes. you know, all, all listeners and all that kind of stuff. But when you're a listener, like I listen to your podcast. Yeah. You know, when you see it pop up in the feed, you're like, oh, great, perfect, right? Yeah, right. And I'm not keeping track of, like, oh, which day is what and all that yeah. kind of thing. 
I yeah. mean, maybe you've got some like super hardcore listeners, but I yeah. think for the most part, you know, we're just we we're just so appreciative when it shows up in our feed. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And I'd like to think folks feel the same way when you pop up in their feed. I, <laughs> you pop up in my feed and I go, oh, dang, he's released another annoying episode. What's going on? <laughs> Any man who describes it. <laughs> no, no, John's, are, John's episodes are, are awesome. His intros are so good. I mean, I almost don't like to listen to his intros. It makes me feel bad about my intros. <laughs> 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 I'm like, ooh, I need to up the professionality a little bit here. Listen, I don't know. listen, Buck. Yeah. Some of your intros are as good as mine, the ones yeah. that I'm featured in. And so <laughs> you that's why I bring you over to help me. <laughs> no, <laughs> like, just... Come on, we can do this. We can make mine better. <laughs> so anyway, without further ado, enjoy these wonderful episodes. Um what for sure, think about watching them on YouTube so that you can see our interaction and then also read the script along with the episode, which is a lot of fun. So uh, enjoy that, and we'll see you folks next week. And John, this has been fun. I mean, I, I love it when you and I can get together, just the two of us, and joke around a little bit and everything. We did uh, the last time I remember doing it was like some of the Christmas episodes. It was just the two of us introduced. I remember you had a sweater on and everything. It was it, those are fun to play and fun yeah. to watch. And, For, and that's a good reason to uh, to watch the YouTube video. You see all the different outfits. Here's my oh jacket. nice yes, look at that. See, you never know what John's going to be wearing. All these different outfits. That is correct. And uh, I was going to say something else about that one. Oh, that Christmas episode. I was going to say. Because uh, I think a lot of people don't realize it's a Christmas episode. One, the one we were doing was the uh, the Christmas gift exchange one uh, with Mel showing up for the first time and uh, back after his accident. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was a great intro that we did and then a great episode. And I got to say, that's like one of my most watched videos on YouTube. I mean, I think it's got a couple thousand at least people that have watched it, which pretty good considering sometimes oh we're at 67 people watch this episode <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> and and then 4,000 people listen to it on my podcast I don't know but we'll just keep uh pounding away at that YouTube and see what happens but yeah anyway without further ado enjoy and we'll see you guys next time and John have a great week. the Jack Benny program presented by Lucky Strike LSMFT Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. Just listen to the words of Thomas Ray Oglesby, ace tobacco auctioneer, who said, At all the markets I've attended, I've seen the makers of Lucky Strike buy good, right, mild leaf. And Harry R. King, independent tobacco buyer. I've seen the makers of Lucky Strike buy fine tobacco that smokes up smooth and mild. Yes, for a real smoke, I picked Lucky. You've just heard the words of independent tobacco experts, the impartial authorities on tobacco quality. So for your own real deep down smoking enjoyment, remember, LSMFT, Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. So smoke that smoke of fine tobacco, Lucky Strike. So round, so firm, so fully packed, so free and easy on the draw. <laughs> The Lucky Strike Program, starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let's go out to Jack Benny's home in Beverly Hills, where we find Jack trying to fix his broken phonograph. Uh, hand me the screwdriver, Rochester. I want to tighten the last screw on this phonograph. Here you are. There. That ought to fix it. I'll turn it on. Hmm. That was too fast. What record was that? Bing Crosby singing White Christmas. <laughs> it sounded more like Effie Boone singing Mother McGree. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can't understand what's wrong with this phonograph. It's never given me trouble before. Well, boss, maybe if I took this and... Oh, Rochester, now look what you've done. You've knocked the horn off. <laughs> Thank you.
And you tipped over the dog, too. <laughs> this is Be Kind to Animals Week. I'm sorry, boss. Let's take another look at the motor and see what's wrong. Okay. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Here's a loose wire, and I see where it's supposed to go. I'll just take it and plug it in. Pull out the plug! Pull out the plug! <laughs> Wow. Wow, what a shock. She was en enough to make my hair stand on end. You want me to go in your room and see? <laughs> you don't have to, I'm wearing it. The show won't be as short as you think. Now, there, there's the wires fixed. Now, let's try some... Now, uh, let's try some other... Let's try some other records. Uh, or, uh, let's try some other records. What have we got in that album? Let me see. I'm Forever Blowing Bubbles, Dardanella, The Sheik of Araby, I Found a Million Dollar Whoops. Baby. <laughs> oh. Keep the home fires burning, Katie, and after the ball is over. No, no, I don't want to spoil those. Play some of the old ones. <laughs> Go ahead. Boss, any records older than these are on cylinders. Uh, well, so, uh, put some of these on. I want to try it out. Yes, sir. Shall we put in a new needle? No, Roger. The needle we have was guaranteed to play a thousand records. We've only used it 873 times. <laughs> mm, what a memory. Memory nothing. Count the notches in the side of the phonograph. <laughs> Now, let's turn it on and see if the record changer is working there. Yes, sir. <laughs> Rochester, what's happened? Why is the phonograph throwing the records up in the air? We never should have fixed it with those parts out of the toaster. <laughs> well, well, I think that... Come in. Hello, Jack. What are you doing? Rochester and I were just fixing it. <laughs> Duck, Mary, here comes the Sheik of Araby. <laughs> Rochester, turn that thing off. We'll use it without the changer. Yes, sir. Jack, what's going on here? Uh, Rochester and I fixed the phonograph. Again? Why don't you get rid of that old thing and buy a new one? Mary, this phonograph isn't so old. Go on. Edison's fingerprints are still on it. What? And she means Edison the boy <laughs> Look, Mary, the phonograph works all right now I mean, I not only fixed it, but I modernized it and brought it right up to date I'll bet you did Well, if you don't believe it, try it yourself All right Have you got two nickels for a dime? <laughs> oh, Mary, put in the dime, be a sport <laughs> No, it plays, it plays three records that way if you put in a quarter, you get a sandwich, a cup of coffee, and a guide to the movie star's home. <laughs> we haven't perfected that yet. Go ahead, Mary, put in the dime. I'll take your word for it. Say, Jack, am I the first one here for rehearsal? Yeah, but the others will be here pretty soon. By the way, Mary, I haven't seen you in a couple of days. What's new? Oh, nothing much. Oh, I got a letter from Mama yesterday. A letter from your mother? Well, what does the happy Chandler of Plainfield have to say? <laughs> I'll read it to you. Go ahead. <clears throat> My darling daughter, Mary, just a few lines to let you know that we are all well and hope you are the same. We've been very busy with the spring planting. Your sister, Babe, helped Papa with the plowing. She did a swell job, but I'll be glad when the horse gets better. <laughs> Mary, your, your, your sister, Babe, pulled the plow? Sure, Jack. She's as strong as a horse. Yes, and when you put a straw hat on her, you can't... Jack, please. <laughs> Excuse me, go ahead with the letter. And Mary, your sister, babe, has a new boyfriend. Yeah. He is the local undertaker here, and I wish he'd give him up. I'm sick of him coming into the house for those secondhand flowers. <laughs> <laughs> but even though he's an undertaker, he's a very progressive and advertises on the radio. His theme song is How Are Things at Rigor Mortis. <laughs> No, it could be to each his urn. 
Hey, I'm hot today. <laughs> Everybody's hot today. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder if I get a guest shot on this program. Really. And Mary, <laughs> right. they've nearly finished building the new high school here. It's very beautiful and modern and will cost over a million dollars. Whoops. <laughs> Jack, are you still doing that? I'm sorry. Go on with the letter. <clears throat> <clears throat> Your father's lodge held their annual celebration last Saturday night. Your father was the guest of honor, and every time he stood up to make his speech, he banged his head. Banged his head? He kept complaining that the ceiling was too low. It wasn't until the party was half over that he found out he was under the table. <laughs> oh. So, he made his speech to three cockroaches and a midget who'd come in out of the rain. Your mother's a regular Milton Berle. <laughs> Well, that's about all the news, Mary. So we'll close with love and kisses from your mother, Hopalong Livingston. <laughs> what a letter. You know, Mary, I can't understand your mother. Oh, Jack, there's nothing wrong with Mama. Maybe not, but I wouldn't be married to her for a million dollars. Whoop! <laughs> Mary, you too? Yeah, I must be contagious. Yeah. Hey, that must be some of the gang. Come in! Well, well, it's Dennis. Where? <laughs> it's you. It's you. Come on in. Hello, kid. Hello, Mr. Benny. Hello, Mary. Hi, Dennis. Fine. Gee, it sure is hot out. Well, it certainly is. This morning, my uncle fried an egg on the sidewalk. He did? Yeah. Yesterday, he fried an egg on the sidewalk, too. No kidding. Yeah. You know where he can find an apartment? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, so that's the reason. Gee, I feel sorry for your uncle. Yeah, so do I. He likes his eggs boiled. <laughs> Oh, fine. <laughs> Dennis, it's really a shame that your uncle has to live out on the street. Yeah, what a place to spend a honeymoon. <laughs> all right, all right. Now, look, Dennis, the scripts aren't here yet, so we can run over your song before rehearsal. Uh, what number are you going to do? Well, I made a record of a new song, and I brought it with me. Would you like to hear it? Sure, kid, sure. Put it on the phonograph. Okay. Is this deductible for my income tax? <laughs> oh, sure. It's a business expense, you know. Now, go ahead. Turn it on. Okay. Jack, what are you doing with that knife? I'm putting another notch on the side of the phonograph. Come on, kid. Let's hear the song. <laughs> Just like I kissed you goodnight How can it be a beautiful morning If you are not in my side I'm not the kind who goes for all those hit and run kisses I won't be satisfied until we're Mr. and Mrs. When am I gonna kiss you good morning Just like I kiss you Mm, I'd like to kiss you good morning Just like I kiss you good night When can I put the ring on your finger? When will we do it up right? We hide away in some cafe The candlelight's bewitching I'd rather have those ham and eggs In our little kitchen but when am I gonna kiss you good morning? Just like I kiss you good a very good song, and I'm glad you recorded it. It'll sound swell on the... Dennis, where'd you get that sandwich? It came out of the phonograph. <laughs> well, what do you know? It worked. Hmm? Yeah, but not very well. Huh? What a sandwich. A slice of ham between two records. Well, that's uh, sort of a double decker. <laughs> ha, 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 ha. 
Mary, I had my glasses on. <laughs> anyway, that, that was a good joke. I thought it was corny. Oh, you did, eh? Yeah, you want to make something out of it? <laughs> yeah. Hit him again, Mary. <laughs> Dennis, just because my humor goes over your head, don't think that you... Come in! Well, here's Phil, Don, and the quartet. Hello, fellas. Hiya, Jackson. Hello, Jack. Mm. Well, boys, as soon as the scripts get here, we can start rehearsal. Okay. Hey, by the way, Phil. Phil, you look wonderful. Nice color in your cheeks and everything. Yes, sir. You can congratulate me, Jackson. I'm a changed man. A changed man. Jackson, and I finally realized I was on the wrong road. I had to do something. Well, what made you realize it? Well, the other night, I went to bed like I always do. I had a good night's sleep, and when I got up in the morning, I staggered all over the room, reached for a chair, and fell flat on my face. <laughs> when did that happen? Thursday morning. Phil, that was the earthquake. <laughs> Holy smoke, and I gave up drinking. <laughs> Phil. Wait a minute, Jackson. Hand me that phone. I got to call Frankie before it's too late. Why, what's the matter? He's on his way to a sanitarium to take the cure. <laughs> well, let him go, Phil. Believe me, it, it won't harm him permanently, I'm sure you will. Say, Mr. Benny, you know what happened to me during the earthquake? What, kid? My mother was giving me a haircut. When things started to shake, she cut one of my ears off. You know what? She cut Dennis, one of my you, ears you, off. You, you got two ears. Now, yes. Now cut that off. <laughs> That's the silliest thing I ever heard. <laughs> now, yes. Jack, what? I want to do some shopping. What about the rehearsal? Well, the scripts will be here in a couple of minutes. Oh, say, Jack, I, I meant to ask you, how did you finally make out with Sam Goldwyn last week? Are you going to do a picture for him? Uh, no, Don. Uh, you see, Mr. Goldwyn wants me to, but... Uh, his next picture isn't my type. It's going to be uh, Les Miserables. Les Miserables? Yes, by Victor Hoagie. <laughs> That's Victor Hugo. You got him mixed up with Hoagie Michelson. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, well, anyway, Mr. Goldwyn and I are going to work out... A... Hey, that must be the script. Come in. Hello, 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 everybody. Long time no see. Well, Steve! Hey, kids, it's my publicity man, Steve Brad. Well, Steve! 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 Steve. Hey, well, Steve, what brings you around? What's up? Benny, I'm worried. We've got to do something about your publicity. Publicity? Yes, sir. Last week I conducted a popularity poll, and compared to the poll I made three years ago, you've only moved up one place. One place? When did that happen? When Hitler killed himself. <laughs> Now, wait a minute, Steve. No time to lose, Benny. I thought it was so urgent that when I couldn't reach it by telephone, I sent a message by carrier pigeon. Carrier pigeon? Oh, that must have been the pigeon that landed on my windowsill. Yeah, yeah. Didn't you see the message tied to his ankle? M -m 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 message? <laughs> Rochester. Don't look at me, boss. You ate the legs. <laughs> yeah, I thought the paper on that leg was a pandy there. Anyway, Steve, I appreciate you worrying about me, but I don't need any publicity. As a matter of fact, only two weeks ago, my picture was on the cover of Newsweek magazine. Hey, Jackson, was that your face? Certainly. How do you like that? I thought it was an ad for spam. <laughs> That's because the photographer told me to stick, my, stick out my tongue. <laughs> That's the case. Someone turns the page and he's got a place to wet his fingers. <laughs> yeah. They think of everything. All right, Benny, I think that picture on the cover of Newsweek was great, but you've got to follow it up with something. Some sort of a stunt. Now, wait a minute, Steve. I don't want any more of your stunts. The last time you had an idea, you wanted me to go to Texas, climb into the big inch pipeline, and swim all the way to New York. And you had a time so I'd crawl out the other end on Groundhog Day. <laughs> no more of that for me. Yeah, I know, I know, but this new idea is different. Benny, I've got an idea that'll make you loved and respected by everybody in the country. Me? Yes, sir. We'll make, take one of the great men in American history, like, well, say, like uh, Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln? Yes, sir. From now on, you're going to do everything Lincoln did. You're going to act like Lincoln, talk like Lincoln. Yes, sir, even walk like Lincoln. But, Steve, I, I don't know how Lincoln walked. Don't you remember? <laughs> now, look, Steve, unless you've got an idea that makes sense, I don't want any part of it. I don't want any... Now, now go home and find... Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold it, hold it, hold it. What? Why didn't I think of this idea before? What an idea. All right, what is it? Baseball. Huh? Look, Bob Hope bought himself the Cleveland Indians. 
Bing Crosby bought the Pittsburgh Pirates. And today, what is everyone talking about? The weather. <laughs> Dennis. Is it unusual? No, no. Well, what are you getting at, Steve? Benny, you've got to have a baseball team. Well, look, Steve, I like the idea, but a baseball team is liable to run into a lot of money. Now, leave it to me, Benny. I'll find you a team that won't cost you much dough. Good, good. I'll get a team that's unknown with the proper training in a year or so. You can sell them to somebody else and turn yourself a net profit of a million dollars. Say, that sounds pretty... Jack, how come you didn't go whoops? When it's coming my way, there's no need for it. <laughs> now, all right, Steve, it's a great idea. Go out and get me a baseball team. Leave it to me, Benny. So long, everybody. Hey, you know, kids, I think Bradley's got a good idea with that baseball team. He certainly has, Jack. And look at the commercials you can do. Commercials with baseball? Why, certainly. You've got your quartet, the sportsmen, right here, and they can take a song and fit it to anything. What are you talking about? Have you got a record of Take Me Out to the Ball Game? That's one of our new ones. <laughs> yes, yes. I'll, tell you, I'll, I'll put it on. Here's a nickel, Jack. Now, nah, this one's on the house. <laughs> to the ball game, take me out with the crowd, buy me a package of lucky strikes, that's the cigarette everyone likes, so let's pump, pump, pump on a lucky, just remember the name, for it's one, two, three lucky strikes at the old ball game. Folks, here we are at the American League Stadium in Goldsboro, North Carolina, and the old ball game is tied up. It's the last half of the ninth, and the bases are loaded. Speedy Riggs is on first, F.E. Boone is on second, and Greenberg's on third. <laughs> and now, coming up to bat is Basil Risedale. He's warming up. He's swinging two big tobacco leaves. He steps up to the plate now. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. He's walking up to the Empire, and he says, Give me a light, bud. He steps back in the batter's box, and here comes the pitch. Look at that ball, so round, so firm, so fully packed, so free and easy on the throw. It's a long, long fly, going to left field. It's going, going over the fence. It lands into the tobacco field, out there with that fine, that light, that naturally mild tobacco. Take me out to the ball game. Take me out with the crowd. The score for a lucky is two to one. You'll smoke and you'll cheer and you'll have so much fun. So let's pop, pop, pop on a lucky. Just remember the name. For it's L S M F F T at the old ball Was wonderful. You know, and I think, Don, Don, I think this baseball idea is going to work out great. It'll give me a lot of publicity. Certainly, Jack. You need publicity. Yeah, you've only got one show. Anyway, I think Steve Bradley is right. If having a baseball team is good for Hope and Crosby, it's good for me, too. You want to know something, Jackson? I used to play baseball. In fact, I was on a team where every player was the band leader. Really, Phil? Yeah, but they threw me out. Why? Every time I slid into third base, I'd spike Jones. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder you can't get the first base, Harris. When they handed out brains, they threw you a curve. Phil, <laughs> well, nobody threw you a curve. You just sat in the bleachers too long without a hat. <laughs> Believe me. You know, Mr. Benny, a bunch of my friends came over to my house yesterday and asked me to play baseball. Oh, did you play? Yeah, but every time I hit the ball, I broke a window. What? I broke seven windows. Well, kid, you must have played too close to the house when you went outside. Oh, outside. <laughs> Dennis, you mean to say you played baseball inside the house? Yeah, you want to make something out of it? Oh, be quiet. Jack, what? why don't 
don't you stop kidding around? I got some shopping to do. Let's get on with the rehearsal. Mary, we can't. The scripts aren't here they yet. They aren't? No. Well, why don't you call up NBC and see what's wrong? All right, I will. Take me out to the ball game. Take me out with the crown. I know a way to save 80 cents. I'll drill two holes and we'll look through the fence. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mabel, what is it, Guy Trude? <laughs> Your outside line is flashing. You get it, will you? Okay. National Broadcasting Company. Oh, hello. What? Oh, just a minute, I'll connect you. Mabel, it's Mr. Benny. I wonder what Spam Face wants now. <laughs> he wants me to connect him with the mimeograph department because they haven't delivered his scripts yet. Script? Well, how do you like that? And he palms himself off as an ad-lib comedian. <laughs> yeah. He couldn't ad-lib a click if he had false teeth. <laughs> Ain't it the truth? But I don't care if he can ad-lib or not. I think he's a cute schmo. <laughs> Why should you think he's cute? He's gone out with me more times than he has with you. He has not. He has too. Oh, Mabel, let's not argue. When we look like we do, we should be happy that we've got each other. But I'm expecting Mr. Benny to pop the question any day now. Pop the question? Why, Mabel, how do you know? What happened? What did he say to you? Tell me all about Your it. The switchboard is buzzing. I won't answer till you tell me. Come on, Mabel, don't keep me in suspense. I'm getting all over goose pimples. <laughs> don't hold out on me. You've agitated my curiosity. Tell me what. Going you... through the switchboard. Oh, okay. Due to a strike, only emergency calls will be handled. <laughs> now, Mabel, tell me what happened. What did he say to you? He didn't say anything. He just kissed me. Why, Mabel Flapsaddle. <laughs> yeah, and I felt so silly. Why? When he kisses me with those thick glasses on, I feel like I'm window shopping. <laughs> Just what you mean. You do? Yeah. One time when he was kissing me, I saw my reflection in his glasses and I thought someone was watching us. <laughs> anyway, Mabel, what I wanted to say. Operator, was... operator. I want the mimeograph to pop up. What? Well, when you get him, tell him to send the scripts out to my house. Goodbye. Well, kids, there's nothing to do but wait. We won't be able to rehearse hold until. On, hold on, Benny. I'm back. Come back. Steve. Yes, Benny, you wanted a baseball team and Bradley didn't let you down. That's swell. Just sign this contract and the team is yours for a thousand dollars. Good, good. There you are. Now, what's the name of the team? The BBBs. BBBs? What's that? Benny's Buxom Bloomer Girls. <laughs> Bloomer Girls? Certainly, Benny. I can see it now. All over the sports page. Pictures of Bob Hope and his Indians. Bing Crosby and his Pirates. Jack Benny and his Bloomers. <laughs> oh, Steve, you can't do this to me. Oh, I don't want... Benny, I'll see you out at the field. Steve, Steve. How do you like that? A girl's team. I got a good mind. Jack, your slip is showing. Oh, quiet. <laughs> Jack will be back in just a minute, but first, here's Basil Rysdale. As you listen to the chant of the tobacco auctioneer, remember... L-S-M-F-T. At 57, at 59, American. Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. And in a cigarette, it's the tobacco that counts. Listen now to the words of a man who's seen millions of pounds of tobacco bought and sold. Mr. George Alfred Webster of Durham, North Carolina. He said, At auction after auction, I've seen the makers of Lucky Strike buy fine tobacco that makes one grand smoke. I've smoked Lucky's myself for 29 years. Those were the words of a man who really knows tobacco. Yes, independent experts like Mr. Webster can see the makers of Lucky Strike consistently select and buy that fine, that light, that naturally mild tobacco. Fine, light, naturally mild tobacco. Remember, LSMFT, Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. <laughs> 
No doubt about it. L-S-M-F-T. Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. And this fine Lucky Strike tobacco means real deep down smoking enjoyment for you. So smoke that smoke of fine tobacco, Lucky Strike. So round, so firm, so fully packed, so free and easy on the draw. Hmm. <clears throat> Had to get me a girls' baseball team. I need that like a moose needs a hat rack. <laughs> Where'd I hear that? Oh, yes, on my repeat broadcast last week. Can't understand why I didn't get a laugh. Maybe, I don't know, maybe it was too clever. Too clever, too clever. <laughs> Quiet, Polly. <laughs> well, everybody's gone home. I might as well practice on my violin. Oh, Rochester. Rochester, give me A, will you? That's close enough. <laughs> Better practice my exercises first. I better not jazz it up yet. I'm, I'm not ready for it yet. <laughs> Maybe I ought to practice intermezzo. NBC, the national broadcasting company. Company. W. Fitch Company presents The Fitch Bandwagon, starring Alice Faye. You never know just how much I love you. You never know just how much I care. And Phil Harris. Won't you come with me to Alabama? Let's go see my dear old mammy. She's frying eggs and frawling hammy, and that's what I like about the South. Like all busy Hollywood personalities, Phil Harris always finds time to read and answer his fan mail. This is what we find him doing yesterday morning. Gee, they might say it's hammy, but sure is a lot of fun to read fan mail from a lot of your friends. I got a whole stack of them here. Let's see. Dear Alice Faye, I like you very much. <laughs> Please send me a picture. Nice. Dear Alice Faye, I like you very much. Please send me a picture. Dear Alice Fay, I like you very much. Please send me a picture. Dear Phil Harris, <clears throat> I like you very much. Please send me a picture of Alice Fay. <laughs> Wise guy. Let's see this next one. Gee, it's written in red ink. You will be the next to go, signed the beast with five fingers. <laughs> Gee whiz, look at that picture of a hand holding a dagger. Gosh, I never did anything to Sinatra. <laughs> the beast with five fingers. Oh, it must be some kind of a joke. Who'd want to knock off a pretty thing like me? <laughs> Still, I don't know. It's Phil? Oh, it's you. Uh, say, Alice. What are you doing in here? Nothing. Uh, Alice. What is it? Look, uh... Can you think of some person who, who would really like to see me out of the way? Well, let's see. There's Mother, my two brothers, Mr. Smith, <laughs> your riders, Jack Benny's riders, your agent, your producer, Mr. Zander. That's Mr. enough! Fail. <laughs> why are you asking these silly questions? Well, 
I guess nothing. I was, well, I was just wondering if I had any enemies. Say, um, come to think of it, do you know where that pistol is they gave me when I was in the Merchant Marine? It's upstairs. But it's all rusty. You left it loaded. I did? Mm-hmm. You know they told you not to put it away with the water in it. <laughs> well, I don't care. The water pistol was a wicked weapon with a full charge of lemonade. It must have been. You were court-martialed for spiking it and shooting yourself in the mouth. That's not true. Phil, that's the door. Go answer it. No, that might be the beast. Well, I'll answer it. What's the matter with you? Uh, excuse me, Miss Fay. It's me, Chicken Snyder from the Encino Gazette. Oh, yes, Mr. Snyder. Come on in. Well, my Miss Fay, you're looking pretty today. Howdy do, Mr. Harris. Wearing a new shade of lipstick. <laughs> Well, as a matter of fact... Oh, no, he means me. Don't sir. holler. I'm pretty, too. <laughs> Say, uh, tell me something, Chick. Uh, how's the newspaper business? Oh, just fine as a frog hair, Mr. Harris. Covered a big story out here just last week. Oh, you did? Yeah, Mr. Higgins down the road got himself pushed into a cream separator. <laughs> Gee, killed him, huh? Well, some folks say it did, some folks say it didn't. All I know is they carried him away in two Dixie cups. <laughs> Pushed in? Uh, you mean he was murdered? Oh, he sure was, and the criminal is still at large. Well, anyone who do a thing like that is a beast. <clears throat> <laughs> uh, say, uh, uh, by the way, Chicken, speaking of, uh, of murders... Uh, did you ever hear of anyone around uh, uh, these parts who got any threatening letters? Oh, as a matter of fact, I did. One time my brother, Turkey, <laughs> he got six of them in a row, but they didn't scare him none. He just ignored them. Yeah, what happened? Fella come and took away his car. <laughs> well, I just dropped in to say how to do it. Drop in and see us anytime, Mr. Snyder. Well, thank you, ma'am. Goodbye, chicken. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Phil, you acted awfully strange all the while Mr. Snyder was here. What's wrong? Oh, I can't explain it, but I got cold shivers that keep running up and down my spine, and, well, honey, I don't know, but I got a funny feeling that before long, all the joys of living will cease. Goodness, have you ever felt this way before? Yeah, just once. When was that? The time your mother moved in with us. <laughs> Well, that's a fine way to talk. When Mother was here, she was wonderful to you. She even donned all your socks on the sewing machine. Yeah, she never bothered to take my feet out. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. There's someone at the kitchen door. Well, you answered. I'm going upstairs. Groceries! Oh, good morning, Julia. Gee, Miss Faye, you look looking beautiful this morning. Why, Julia Sabruzio. You don't know this, Miss Faye, but every week before I come up here... I do a big thing for you. You do? Yeah. I wash. <laughs> you wash? Yeah. Not only that, I always come to your house first. I want you to get the full benefit. <laughs> well, I appreciate getting my order early, Julia. Ah, oh, that's all right. Hey, Miss Faye, your gardener was telling me you got a gopher in your lawn again. Yes, I think it's the same old one we tried to get rid of last year. Hey, maybe I can help you catch him. No, I don't think so. I already sent the exterminator a note. We're going to use poison. Eh, poison ain't no good. The thing to do is wait till he comes out in the open and then beat him to death with a club. <laughs> that doesn't sound very practical. You ought to talk to my mother. She's an expert on the subject. Oh, has your mother had gophers? No, just me and my brother. <laughs> Julia. Yeah, Miss Faye. Goodbye. Farewell, soulmate. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with me, but I can't get that note out of my head. The beast with five fingers. I can see him now with that dagger. Gee whiz, when the time comes, I've got to think of Alice. Sure, that's right. Alice. Maybe when he lunges at me, I can hold her in front of me. Hiya, Daddy. Ah, hello, baby Alice. Hey, have you seen your mommy? Yes. She was just talking to the grocery boy. She was? Yes. I heard her say she wanted to get rid of something. 
<laughs> Get rid of something? That's right. She already sent the note. She sent the note? Wait a minute, Harris. You're getting punchy. <clears throat> Alice, don't look a bit like a beast, but still, there's her brother. <laughs> hey, look, honey, uh, uh, what else did they say? Well, Mommy was talking about poison, but Julia said, no, get him out in the open and beat him to death with a club. <laughs> Say, look, kid, look, um, did your mommy actually mention my name? Well, she did say something about an old gopher. <laughs> All right, that does it. This thing has gone too far. I'm going to have a talk with that woman. Alice. Yes, Phil? Let me see your hands. My hands? Yeah. One, two. He gets, he does have five fingers. <laughs> Had me two trusty pistols, had me two leather holsters swinging by my side. Had a two-gated pony till the day matrimony took my bridle and gave me a bride. I was riding down that trail to Santa Fe when I met a pretty gal along the way. I said, haven't we met before? Then she drew that 44, so I tipped my hat and slowly rode away. I went riding down that trail to Santa Fe. When I met another gal along the way I said, baby, you're a dream She says, touch me and I'll scream So I tipped my hat and slowly rode away Rode away, rode away Cause there wasn't no excuse for me to stay Tipped my hat, that was that Yes, I left that kitten sitting where she sat I went riding down that trail to Santa Fe When I met another gal along the way I said, baby, are you taking two? She said, partner, I'll take you. So I tipped my hat and settled down to stay. <laughs> settled down, settled down. How I cursed the day I ever rode to town. What a life, what a life. Ever since the day I took myself that wife <clears throat> If you ever ride that trail to Santa Fe And you meet a pretty gal along the way Better stop and think of me I was happy, I was free Till I tip my hat and settle down to stay That day, settle down in dear old Santa Fe Ladies, no one will compliment your hair if it's dull, brittle, and full of dandruff. But people will praise the looks of your hair if you use Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. Fitch is a real beauty shampoo that gives your hair renewed luster, a flattering softness, and that grand quality of being easy to manage. It restores the hair to a normal, healthy condition, enabling it to take and keep a wave longer. Fitch's reconditioning action works effectively on all colors and textures of hair. Then, since it's completely soluble, Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo rinses out instantly in either hard or soft water. No special after-rinse is needed. Fitch cleanses thoroughly, and it's economical to use, too. Thousands of attractive women know Fitch reveals the natural sheen of their hair, leaves it romantically soft, glamorously smooth. So if you want your hair to be beautiful, to win more compliments than ever before, use Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo regularly. Fitch is spelt F-I-T-C-H. Hey, Frankie. Frankie, come on, open up. Let me in. Hi, Phil. Come on in. Hey, look, Frankie. I got something very important to tell you. Yeah? Well, sit down. Okay. Oh, I beg your pardon. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, lady. Uh, I didn't see you in that chair. 
Goodbye, Frankie. I'll see you later. <laughs> Who was that? Her? My mother. She brings me hot soup. <laughs> hey, you look worried, Curly. Something wrong? Now, look, Frankie, I want you to pay attention. Yeah? It's going to sound silly, but listen to me. All right. I think that Alice is getting ready to knock me off. <laughs> yeah? What else is new? <laughs> Look, Frankie, will you listen to me? This is serious. Okay. Now, listen to this. Here's the reason I know. First, she sent me a note signed, The Beast with Five Fingers. Mm -hmm. And now she and that grocery boy, that Abruzio, are getting ready to poison me. Poison you? Yeah. How could she do it? Destroy Phil Harris. Listen to me, Frankie. This is the worst thing that's happened to beauty since some guy slashed the Mona Lisa. Well, Curly, she must have some motive. Haven't you been writing a lot of checks lately? Certainly, but that was part of the deal when I married her. <laughs> well, Curly, even if she is a movie star, she wouldn't bump you off for nothing. You must have done something. No, I ain't. Now, come on, Curly. Make a clean breast of it. Come out in the open. No, no. If I do that, she beats me to death with a club. <laughs> you know, Curly, I've been thinking. If this is true, it could be the biggest thing that ever happened to you. It could? Sure. Think of the publicity you'll get. It's a natural. Alice Faye poisons mate. Why, they'll be dancing in the street. <laughs> Cut that out. It ain't funny. Yeah. Now, look, Curly, you got this all wrong. Alice wouldn't knock you off of the world. She wouldn't? Of course not. You're too stupid. <laughs> What's that got to do with it? You ever heard of anyone being unkind to a moron? <laughs> Gee, Frankie, when you say things like that, you make me feel good all over. <laughs> now, look, Curly, even if she did want to knock you off, she wouldn't have the nerve. It's too big a chance. Chance? Sure. She'd have to answer to Petrillo. Yeah. Sure, that's right, ain't it? He'd take her card away. But after all, she did send the note, and she was talking about poison. And you can believe it or not, but I'm almost afraid to go home tonight. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do, Curly. I'm playing a band date this evening. On the way home, I'll drop in at your place, see if everything's okay. You come by the house? Yeah. Oh, gee, Frankie, you're swell. Any way you look at it, you got nothing to worry about. If she should give you the business... Me and the boys will give you the biggest funeral you ever saw. Funeral? Sure. I can see you now as you leave for that place where all paid-up union members go. <laughs> Wrapped in old copies of That's What I Like About the South. <laughs> Gad, Frankie, such loyalty. <laughs> Daddy go? I don't know, Phyllis. About an hour ago, he got a wild look in his eye and went out of here like a streak. Oh, is Grandma coming to live with us again? <laughs> no. No, honey, but your father's been acting awfully strange today. Daddy's an awful problem child, isn't he? Yes, Phyllis, he's murder. <laughs> Life's a game, but who can play it all alone? Every chap should hold a heart that's all his own. Love may come at first sight, they told me. When I saw you, I knew I had found my only love when I met. I know that you know that I'll go where you go. I choose you, won't lose you. I wish you knew how much I long to hold you in my arms. This time is my time, will soon be goodbye time. Then in the starlight, hold me tight with one more little kiss, say nighty night. my 
goodbye time will soon be goodbye time then in the starlight hold me tight with one more little kiss say nighty night with one more little kiss say nighty Well, thanks, Julius, for coming all the way back again with the ice cream. Ah, that's okay. Anything for you, soulmate. <laughs> Bye. Thanks again. Well, home again. Gee, I'm glad I had that talk with Frankie. He's so reassuring. <laughs> Alice couldn't have been thinking what I thought she was thinking. Shucks. She was, for all I know, a lot of people have five fingers. I love life and I want to live and I... Uh-oh. Julius Abruzio, what are you doing around here? Hiya, Mr. Harris. I just brought up a package for Miss Faye. Look, Julius, let me tell you something, kid. If I ever find you hanging around here again, I'm going to beat your brains out. Now beat it. Do you hear me? Beat it! Gee, okay. You really tied one on today, didn't you? <laughs> beat it! Phil, you better get ready for dinner. I have it almost ready. Dinner? Are, uh, are, are you going to get the dinner tonight? Mm-hmm. I gave Sissy the evening off. We're alone in the house. Huh? <laughs> Look, uh, honey, uh, hey, uh, why don't we eat out tonight? Oh, don't be silly, Phil. I've gone out of my way to prepare something special for you. <laughs> That's what I'm afraid of. <laughs> well, don't stand there. Go get washed up. Dinner's almost ready. All right, all right. Oh, so that's it, huh? She's going to let me have it at dinner. <laughs> hello, Daddy. Oh, hello, Philly. Hello, Alice. How are my little girls? Fine, Daddy. Say, uh, are you kids staying up to eat dinner with Daddy and Mommy tonight? No, Mommy. No, Mommy gave us our supper before you came home. Oh, she fed you already, huh? <laughs> Gee whiz, I thought maybe that you kids could taste my food. I mean, uh, <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you. Oh, I'm all upset. I don't know what I'm thinking about. Look, babies, you love your daddy, don't you? I've always been kind and sweet and, and considerate, haven't I? Oh, say that for Mommy, Hotshot. We don't have any money. <laughs> I don't mean that, Phyllis. <coughs> now, you listen to me. What I'm trying to get at is this, that, well, your daddy may have to go on a long, long trip. Long trip? Yes, Alice. I might even die. Oh, I see. You're taking your band on the road again. <laughs> Wait a minute, honey. You see, I'm... Oh, Phil. Yes? Supper's ready. Supper? Mm-hmm. When do you see this dinner? It'll kill you. <laughs> well, come on. Honey, honest. I'm not hungry. Not hungry? Look at that wonderful steak I fixed for you. Yeah, but what's this stuff on top of it? Why, it's smothered in mushrooms. Mushrooms? Are you sure they're mushrooms? Of course. Then why is that toad sitting under one of them? <laughs> oh, don't be silly. That's your baked potato. Honey, I keep telling you I can't eat anything. Look, I'm going out in the living room. <laughs> Harris, what's wrong with you this evening? I spent all afternoon getting that dinner and you didn't touch a thing. Well, somehow I wasn't hungry. Well, Phil, it's 10 o'clock. Are you going to sit in that chair like a corpse all evening? 
Some folks say I is, and some folks say I ain't. <laughs> oh, stop acting silly and come to bed. Come to bed, she says. I ain't falling for that gag. <laughs> She'll probably murder me in my sleep. If I get it, I want to be standing up. <laughs> oh, this is awful. I wonder if Frankie's going to stop by. Come on, Harris, pull yourself together. Why did I have to be born a yellow coward? <laughs> Maybe if I turn the radio on, I'll feel better. Slowly, stealthily, Lady Wingate crept into her husband's bedroom. <laughs> A flash of cold steel in the moonlight, and the deed was done. <laughs> Gosh, what a program. With one swift blow, Lady Wingate had freed herself from the man she'd secretly despised for six long years. As she surveyed her work, her blood was frozen in an instant of terror, and she shrieked the dead man's name. Phil Harris. Oh! <laughs> yes, he's fainted. What'll I do? Hi, Alice. Oh, Frankie, come quick. He's there on the floor. Oh, you did it, huh? <laughs> Alice, will you marry me? <laughs> Frankie, Frankie, Phil fainted. Oh. Here, help me put him on the sofa here by the fire. Okay. Not too close. It's pretty hot. Easy does it. There we are. I'll go get him a glass of water. Water? Okay, we'll force it down his throat. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Where am I? What are those red flames? And those hot coals? <laughs> Gee, it's a fire. Hiya, Curly. Hello, Frankie. What are you doing down here? <laughs> no, no, Phil, you ain't dead. Everything's all right. You just fainted. Here's the water, Frankie. Oh, we don't need it, Alice. He just came out of it. You get away from me, Alice, you monster. You're the beast with the five fingers. What are you talking about? You know what I'm talking about. You and Julius tried to poison me. Poison? Poison? Phil, I got that to kill a gopher. Gopher? Well, then what about this note? Now, look at it. You will be the next to go, signed the beast with five fingers. Let me see that. Oh, my goodness. Did you ever think to turn this note over? Huh? Yes. Look what it says on the back. Everybody's seeing it. You will be the next to go, see the beast with five fingers, starting this week at your neighborhood theater. <laughs> Hey, Frankie, where are you going? Home. Well, what are you sore about? Sore about? You ruined my life. <laughs> what do you mean? You spoiled the beautiful funeral and my chance to be Mr. Alice Faye. Oh. <laughs> Alice and Phil will be back in just a moment. A good investment pays off, and none pays off better in good grooming than Fitch's dandruff remover shampoo. For Fitch doesn't stop with removing the so-called loose dandruff. It actually penetrates and cleanses the thousands of tiny hair openings on the scalp to dissolve all traces of dandruff. Then this more efficient shampoo whips up into a rich, frothy lather that floats the dissolved dandruff away. Yes, Fitch is the only shampoo made who's guaranteed to remove dandruff with the first application is backed by one of the world's largest insurance firms. Fitch's penetrating antiseptic action gives your scalp as well as your hair a thorough cleansing. It leaves your scalp tingling, your hair healthy and alive looking, and as clean as clean can be. So buy a bottle at your drug or toilet goods counter or have professional applications at your beauty or barber shop. Fitch's dandruff remover shampoo is an investment that really pays off in well-groomed hair. Say, folks, before we say goodnight, Alice has something that she wants to say to you. Thanks, Phil. This is important to all of us, but especially so to those of us with children. Right now, the American Cancer Society needs our help. I don't have to tell you. We all know what a dread disease cancer is. Its annual toll is enormous. 
and it strikes both young and old. So I hope during this drive that each one of us will do all he can to help this fight against cancer. Send your contributions to the American Cancer Society in New York or to your local committee. Thank you. Tune in next week when the F.W. Fitch Company again brings you the Fitch Bandwagon with Alice Fay and Phil Harris. This program was written by Bob Mosher and Joe Connolly, directed by Paul Phillips, with the original music composed and conducted by Walter Sharp. Included in the cast were Janine Roos, Ann Whitfield, Walter Titley, and Elliot Lewis. Alice Fay appears to the courtesy of 20th Century Fox. Laugh a while, let a song be your style, you spit shampoo. Don't despair, use your head, save your hair, you spit shampoo. Men with good-looking hair agree that the scalp is the basis of hair health. So do as many of them do. Massage a few drops of Fitch's Ideal Hair Tonic into your scalp every day. It is not sticky or greasy. Get Fitch's Ideal Hair Tonic. Bill Foreman speaking. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Hello again. This is Buck Benny talking. Welcome to Tuesday. Today on the Jack Benny Show, we have Burns and Allen appearing. Um, Jack um, would often have George Burns and Gracie Allen on his show, either as guest stars or they'd take over his show whenever he was sick or out of town, that sort of thing. Um, they do a fantastic job. Of course, he and George ben Burns were best friends. And I do, I, I think these episodes are really interesting when they feature Burns and Allen to see uh, how much they do with George and how much they do with uh, Gracie. Um, Gracie uh, always does um, just a brilliant job on Jack's show. And you can tell Jack, whenever he interfaces with George and Gracie, he always has trouble staying in character and not just losing it because he, he does think they are so funny and they're such good friends of his. Um, I thought I'd mention, too, I, I haven't had a chance to mention the podcast. Uh, two weeks ago, um, we had the um, first episode with Eddie Anderson. And in that episode... Uh, it's interesting, one, because it has Andrew Anderson not playing the Rochester character, but we get our first glimpse of him in sort of a prototype of the Rochester character. Um, and the audience and Jack and the writers liked him so much they kept bringing him back, and eventually he becomes a regular on the show. Um, but that episode's interesting for a number of things. Um, the first part that I find interesting with that episode is the fact that... Uh, they're at uh, the train station, and a lot of the train station gags come up, which is, uh, I always like those, Anaheim, Sousa, and Cucamonga, and um, <coughs> train leaving on track five, and all of that stuff, but uh, it also has where um, Mary is going to pick up a magazine for Jack, and he asks her to pick up a nudist magazine for him, uh, which seems really uh, risque for the time. And then, of course, she agrees to pick it up for him and gets it for him. So uh, I just think it's a, a funny episode that's really different and really um, uh, humorous just just <laughs> in the, the approach to things. And um, so if you haven't had a chance to listen to that from two weeks ago, make sure you do listen to that. Um, and I hope you enjoy Burns and Allen tonight on Jack Benny's show. And I hope you enjoy all of our other Tuesday night shows. Um, Duffy's Tavern and, and the Hallmark Playhouse. And we will see you again tomorrow or next Tuesday. J-E-L-L-O. The Jell-O program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston and Phil Harris and his orchestra. The orchestra opens a program with All's Fair and Love and War from the Gold Diggers of 1937. 
When you go to the theater or the movies, you always expect the entertainment to reach a thrilling climax. And the same thing is true of a dinner. So if you want your dinner to wind up on a really exciting note, by all means, serve Jell-O for dessert. A gay, colorful mold of it in any of Jell-O's six delicious flavors. Jell-O is truly delicious and full of the refreshing flavor of fresh, ripe fruit. Jell-O always brings a touch of color and joy to the end of any meal. So order genuine Jell-O from your grocer tomorrow and you'll be sure of that extra rich fruit flavor which makes Jell-O the most popular gelatin dessert in the world. But accept no substitute. Get the real thing. Genuine Jell-O. gentlemen, we bring you that Hollywood fashion plate whose pockets bulge from his tailor's bills, Jack Benny. Well, well. Well, hello again. This is Jack Benny, your Beau Brumell speaking. Now listen, Don, this new spring suit of mine is paid for. And you'll have to admit that I do look pretty nifty, don't I? At the risk of losing my job, No. <laughs> Now, wait a minute. It's a pretty swell suit. I've been looking in the mirror all afternoon, and we ought to know. Oh. (laughs) Say, Don, that's a snappy spring outfit you're wearing. Uh, Tailor-made, isn't it? Yes, yes. Do you like it? Oh, yeah, yeah. It looks like it was made for the Ritz brothers. (laughs) Well, one thing, Jack, it's individual. There's not another one in the whole country like it. Well, naturally, there's no cloth left. Say, Don, Don, yeah. come here a minute, will you? All right. Get a load of that. Huh? Oh, come here. Okay. All right, Jack, I'm right here, yeah. Right, get, a, get a load of that sport coat Phil Harris is wearing. You know? <laughs> it is loud, isn't it? Loud? It's the first time I ever saw a sunset with a belt in the back. <laughs> Say, Phil. Yes, Jack. Look, Phil, I don't like to be bossy, but I wish you'd dress more conservatively, especially for this program. After all, you're not a Toreador. What about that coat you've got on? Well, what's the matter with it? Well, it looks like your tailor took a crazy quilt and put buttons on it. Oh, yeah? Well, I like this coat, and I bought it. Well, if you ever get tired of it, you can grind it up into chili. <laughs> well, still trying to get your watch back, eh? Well, it won't work, old fellow. <laughs> oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Gee, look at you all dressed up. Wow. Yeah, how do I look? You look like you were thrown out of the Easter parade. <laughs> that's so. Uh, that's an old suit, isn't it? It is not. And anyway, it's how you wear it. You don't see any holes in this suit, do you? A moth with any pride wouldn't go near it. <laughs> Atta girl, Mary. Atta girl, Mary. Atta girl, Mary. <laughs> now, listen, fellas, you can kid all you want to, but if you want to know the truth, I'm considered the best-dressed man in Hollywood. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, who was that? Uh, Adolf, mind you. Oh. What's he laughing about? I bought this suit from his gardener. You know what kills me? When a fellow tries to... Do... Oh. Come in. Special delivery for Mary Livingston. Uh, I'm Mary Livingston. I know, just sign here. Hmm, a little fresh there, buddy. There you are. Thanks, miss. Ha, huh, get a load of that suit. <laughs> Wise guy. Who's the uh, Who's the letter from, Mary? Uh, from my mother. I'll read it. Oh, your mother again. Why doesn't she get her own program? Um, she says. Well, that... just forget about it. We haven't got time. Hey, Jack. Letter. Here comes Kenny, all dressed up. Boy, I'll bet he knows it's spring too. I'll give you two to one. He don't. <laughs> yeah, well, look at them all dolled up in sport clothes. Hello, Kenny. Ain't I something? <laughs> Yes, but I can't put my finger on it. <laughs> Where'd you get that outfit, Kenny? Oh, from a little tailor around my neighborhood. Pretty cold, isn't it? Cold? Looks more like a vest to me. Gosh, did those sleeves fall off again? <laughs> Turn around there. Let me look at you, Kenny. Hmm, nice material. But look, isn't that coat awfully long? Well, the pants aren't finished yet. Oh. oh. 
Don't let him kid you, Kenny. You look all right. Those are new shoes you got on, too, aren't they? Yeah, but they hurt like the dickens. Well, they'll stretch. Say, do you think they'd feel better if I took the shoe trees out? <laughs> yeah, why don't you do that, Kenny? It'll, it will be. Say, Jack, what? you ought to hear this letter from my mother. Gee, she's cute. Well, as long as she's cute, go ahead and read it. Okay. Uh, Newark, New Jersey, April 8th. Newark? I thought your folks lived in Plainfield. Uh, there was a cyclone. Oh. Uh, dear daughter Mary, I was happy to get your letter and glad to know that you are well. I was so excited when I talked to you on the phone last Sunday that I forgot to turn off the gas range. How do you get oatmeal off a ceiling? <laughs> Tell her to stand on her head when she mops the floor. Uh, we had a lovely Easter, except for one thing. Your brother Hillard mixed the egg dyes in your father's derby. <laughs> and when your father put his hat on, was his face red. <laughs> also blue, green, and yellow. Nice family you've got. Uh, but everything turned out all right as he went to a masquerade that night dressed as a rainbow. Well, that was quick thinking. Yowza. <laughs> <laughs> we had a lot of fun on April Fool's Day, too. Everybody was here for dinner, and we sold your Uncle Herman's knife and fork to the tablecloth. Well, it must have been funny. It would have been some joke if Uncle Herman didn't eat with his hands. <laughs> That's fine. Doesn't he ever use his knife and fork? Only to comb his hair. Oh. Uh, the dinner was strictly formal. Everybody kept their shoes on. I hate those ritzy affairs. <laughs> Uh, right in the middle of the meal, a funny thing happened. The cat jumped on the table and knocked over Papa's bottle of gin. Papa got so mad, he gave the cat a milky fin. <laughs> milky fin? Isn't that awful? Uh, <laughs> did I tell you that your grandpa came to visit us last week, and he acts the same as ever? Oh. Uh, last night, we caught him starching his beard so he could use it for a shoehorn. <laughs> Mary, find out if he sleeps with a shoehorn over the quilts or under the quilts. Uh, no other news except that your cousin Rita and her husband aren't getting along. They're always fighting. That's too bad. Uh, this morning they borrowed our axe to make twin beds. <laughs> uh, no more news or ink. So we'll close with love to you, Jack, Don, Kenny, Phil, strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, and lime. And the millions of people who eat it every day. Yours truly, Mrs. Livingston. Well, I'm glad that's over. Oh, oh here's some more, Jack. Mm. Uh, P.S., there was another cyclone, and we're back home. <laughs> well, there's only one thing that can top that. Sing, Kenny. <clears throat> Let's move.
Moonlight and Shadows from the Jungle Princess, sung by Kenny Baker in his own inimitable way. And very good, Kenny. Oh, you always say I sing good. Well, you do, don't you? Yeah, but you don't have to rub it in. <laughs> Isn't Kenny fast on the repartee tonight, Mary? Huh? He's got a mind like a snail with a rheumatism. Yeah. <laughs> I see, Mary, you're keen. <laughs> Keep that up, Kenny, and someday you'll be starching your beard. You know? I, I ruined that gag myself there. And now, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> as we haven't done a play in some time for our feature attraction tonight, we are going to present our original hair-raising melodrama, that panorama of surging emotions, that symphony of the great outdoors, entitled... See who that is, Mary. Why, it's Gracie Allen. Mm, hello, Gracie. Well, Jack, Benny, of all people, what are you doing here? <laughs> Stuff up the microphones, fellas. Well, Gracie, this is a surprise. Well, not to me. Uh. Georgie Pawgie sent me over here to give you an important message. He knows he can trust me on account of I'm unreliable. Well, why didn't he come himself? Why? Yeah. Why? Well, well, he had to stay there so you'd know where the message came from. Oh. <laughs> you see, if he came over here, he wouldn't have to have to send me with a message. Oh. But the message is to you, and you're here. Uh, so, yeah. it would be very silly for me to go somewhere else with a message for you. <laughs> I would it. <laughs> well, I think that... The... Oh, hello, Mary. Oh. Did you have a good time in New York? Ooh, gee, what a cute hat. Do you like it? Oh, it's beautiful and so original. Just like mine. I must have made it yourself. <laughs> they are alike, only mine's got something under it. <laughs> well, um... <laughs> uh, mine, uh, mine is just plain. I like simple things. Have you seen George... No, Grace. And what's the what's the message he sent to me? Is the message? Yeah. The oh, the oh, message. Oh, Jack. Uh, do you think that about him? Oh, well, well, well. Here's Georgie Pawgie now. Give me a kiss. Hey, wait a minute. Gracie, Gracie, that's Don Wilson. Oh, it is not. Don Wilson is a box of Jello. <laughs> Don Wilson is our announcer, and anyway, he's twice as big as George. Well, who cares? I'm not going to lift him. <laughs> oh, and Jack, who's this cute little boy? That's Kenny Baker, our tenor. Say hello, Kenny. Hello. Oh. <laughs> Gee, you're cute. I I'll bet you're smart, too. Am I? I got a mind like a snail with a rheumatism. <laughs> oh, snails with rheumatism. Oh, that must be delicious. See what you started, Mary? How can a snail get rheumatism? Sleeping in a shell with a window open. <laughs> I don't get it. That we know. Now, look, Gracie, we have a program to do. Have you thought of the message yet? Uh, what message? The message that George sent. Oh, you can give it to me later. <laughs> now, look, you told me that... I give up. Look, Gracie, it doesn't have anything to do with your starting a new program on the air tomorrow night, does it? No, this is something important. Well, isn't that important? You and George are going on the air for grape nuts. We get money. <laughs> Quiet, Mary. They'll want it, too. <laughs> Say, Phil, find out if there is... This is still the Jell-O program, will you? It certainly is, with those six delicious flavors. Mm -hmm. Strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, and tomato juice. <laughs> now, look, Gracie, if you'll just sit down now and be quiet, we'll go on with the play I was about to announce. Well, don't, don't mind me. Uh, I'll have us laugh. Oh, Phil, Jay. Dolby, Dolby. Phil, come down off the piano. Oh, no, not me. Oh. <laughs> come on, Dolby. Let's go over in the tuba where we can be alone. Yeah. Yeah, do that. And now, ladies and gentlemen, as our feature attraction this evening, we are going to present an old favorite. Why? <laughs> because. One that I know... <laughs> That's fine. One that I know you'll all be waiting to hear. Another thrilling episode of that rip-snorting drama of the West, Buck Benny Rides Again. Oh, 
Gracie. Oh, don't mind me. I won't be any trouble. No, I know that. <laughs> now, in our play this evening, Mary Livingston will again be Daisy Carson, my sweetheart. Don and Kenny will be my deputy sheriff. And if Phil Harris will come down off the piano, he can be Pappy. Oh, what will I be, Jack? You can be quiet. <laughs> Is it much of a part? I hope so. <laughs> now, immediately after the next number, folks, we will take you to the little cow town of Rump State, Texas. <laughs> Where we find... Come in. Hello, Jack. Is Gracie here? <laughs> yes, George. Gracie is here, and I wish you'd keep her in your own yard. Well, I sent her over here to give you some tickets for our broadcast tomorrow night. Where is she? Well, here I am, Georgie Party. Put me down, Phil. Hmm. <laughs> Uh, look, Gracie, what did you do with those tickets I gave you to give Jag? Well, I put them in your pocket. Well, then it's lucky I came. Oh, so that's the message you had for me, Gracie. Well, yeah. Why didn't you think of it before? I don't know. I must be slipping. Well, it's time you woke up. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> Mary, what are you laughing at? I don't know. Hello, George. Hmm. <laughs> Ah, well, I see things are just as crazy on this program. Well, thanks, George. Thanks for those tickets. Nice dovetailing. And look, we're going to start... <laughs> we're going to start our play right after the next number. Uh, would you mind keeping an eye on Gracie? You know, keep her under control. Oh, you're nuts, too, huh? <laughs> well, do the best you can. Uh, play, Phil. Say, Georgie, hasn't Phil Harris got the laziest hair? Yes, <laughs> played by Phil Harrison as orchestra. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to present our latest episode of Buck Benny Rides Again, or Ready, Willing, and Lame. <laughs> the scene is the office of the sheriff of Cactus County. Gracie, 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 put that drum back in the orchestra. Oh, is the drummer too? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Hmm, starting out. The scene is the office of the sheriff of Cactus County, where we find Buck Benny busy opening his morning mail. Curtain. Music. <laughs> Doggone these wooden envelopes. Hey, deputies. Yes, yes sheriff. sir. Come here and help me open this letter. Why, Buck, you're prying off the top of your desk. Dern if I ain't. <laughs> I'm getting into more trouble since I lost my glasses. This morning, I put the bridle on the wrong end of my horse. <laughs> 
Say, Sheriff. Yeah? You got your pants on backwards, too. Thanks. I've been looking for my hip pockets all morning. <laughs> Say, Wilson, any news on Cactus Face? Nope. Ain't seen hide nor hair of him. Well, it's been going on long enough. We got to get that, Frito. Dead or alive. Oh, isn't he wonderful, George? Quiet, Gracie. Yeah. You know, boys? <laughs> Cactus Bays have stolen every cow in these here parts. Fine state of affairs, not a cow left in the county. Oh, well, that's too bad. I'll be a cow for you. Moo! Quiet, moo, quiet, moo. quiet. Come on, Moon. Come on. Quiet. Gracie, we're in the sheriff's office. We're in jail. Oh, yeah? Then where's my daddy? Now, Gracie, please. Well, my daddy's in jail more than your daddy, isn't he? Hey, Gracie, go ahead, Jack. <laughs> now, listen, deputies. Getting cactus face alive may be dangerous, so be on your guard and stick close together. Meanwhile, I'm going out and investigate. Good luck, Sheriff. Good luck, Sheriff. Good luck, Sheriff. Thanks, men. <laughs> Wish I had my glasses, though, and blind as a bat. Well, boys, if you need me, I'll be over at Daisy Carson. So long. <laughs> Doggone it, I thought there was a door there. <laughs> There is now. <laughs> well, a little ventilation won't hurt none. Go along, boys. Go on. Oh, wait. I'm going with you. Oh, no, you're not. Lock her up, men. Oh, okay. Steve, come in. Steady there, partner. Daisy Carson's house and step on it. Get out. Get out. Fuck, Benny, rise again. <laughs> I wonder if this is still Daisy's house. Haven't been in here in over six weeks. Come in. Come in. Daisy, that's my line. Well, why did I say it? That's fine. You steal my part and then you want a reason. Well, <laughs> that's because I haven't got a reason. Mm, you're telling me. Uh, let's split it, Gracie. I'll say come and you say in. All right. I wish somebody would say it. It's raining out here. <laughs> Hello, Daisy. Hello, tall, dark, and nearsighted. Well, gal, ain't seen you for some time. You sure look pretty. Lost a little weight, ain't you? That's the hall tree. I'm over here. <laughs> well, Daisy, it's spring. And you know that old saying, in the spring, a young man's fancy like the curse of the thoughts of love. So I'm going to ask you once more to marry me. Will you, gal? Uh, what did I say last time, Buck? You said no. Well, add positively. <laughs> yeah, when you say that, you're a tearing at my heart string. I know I ain't much. And I ain't good at fancy <laughs> Like them now, city fellas. But underneath this old red shirt beats a heart of gold. Oh, what an acting. Isn't he wonderful, Mary? No. Ain't that the truth? <laughs> Thought we locked her up in a cell. Oh, George, he's thinking of my brother. Oh. My brother's name is Sal. Of course, we only call him Sal for short. His whole name is Imbecile. Oh, Imbecile, yeah. Is that the one who's living? No, no, he's the one who sings tenor. Oh, the tall one, yeah. The yeah. one who looks like a steam clam. Yeah, the pretty one. Yeah, the one with the face. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Save that for tomorrow night. Oh, yeah, whose program is this? Is it your program or my program? It's my program. Well, then don't act like it's your program. <laughs> Gracie, please, go ahead, Jack. Thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> well, uh, well, deputies, or well, Daisy. <laughs> What's your pappy doing these days? I hear he's cut down on his drinking. Yep, he's only using one arm now. Oh. <laughs> How that brandy he was making turn out. Something went wrong with it, and it hardened in the bottles. Too bad. A total loss, eh? Nope. Pappy just breaks the glass and eats it watermelon style. <laughs> Mighty practical idea. Say, Daisy. Daisy? Oh, what's your name? Mary or Daisy? Gracie. Oh, that's silly. Gracie's my name. <laughs> I was saying... That... I, I like uh, Mary better than Daisy, don't you, Gracie? Well, 
some daisies I like, Mary, and some daisies I don't. Oh, George! Gracie! Using Watson, Renard... Quiet! Quiet! <laughs> Daisy, Daisy, where's your pappy? Uh, he was papering the room here this morning, and that's the last I saw of him. Gosh, that is new wallpaper, isn't it? But wait a minute, what's that big lump on the north wall? Here comes Pappy now. <laughs> Hello, Buck. Hello, Frank. Mind moving, little Buck? I gotta put some paper right there where you're standing. Pappy, you're not gonna paper the floor, are you? Shucks, honey, I thought it was the ceiling. <laughs> Oh, I'm Jeff Joe Harris. Isn't he cute? No, I am too. <laughs> Them dern Easterners are ruining our play. What was you saying, Buck? I wasn't saying you did a mighty good job paper and looks fine. Doggone it, Daisy. I got bad news for you. I gotta tear down all this paper I put up. But, Pappy, it looks swell. Can't help it, honey. I lost my job. <laughs> I'll help you find it, Frank. Okay, look for a lump with a kick in her, Buck. <laughs> After a kick. <laughs> There's the phone, Daisy. Rip off the paper and answer it. Okay. Hello? Hello? Funny, can't hear a thing. Thanks, Buck. You found my job. <laughs> uh, here. Here's the phone. Hello? Uh, just a moment. For you, Buck. Thanks. Hello? Hello, deputy. What's that? You did? I'll be right with you. So long. What's up, Buck? My boy just located a hideout of Cactus Face Elmer. They're waiting for me down by the creek, and I'm heading that way. So long, gal. So long, Buck. Come on, partner. Yeah. Giddy up, partner. Giddy up. Gracie. Gracie. Giddy up, partner. Giddy up, partner. Gracie. Gracie. Come on, partner. Look, Gracie rides again. Yippee. <laughs> My own call for starting this play, man. Everybody would like to think of new and exciting dinners seven days a week, and no mistake. Of course, there's a limit to the number of kinds of meat or fish you can serve, but when you're thinking of dessert, there's no end to the number of ways in which you can serve jello. And here's a new jello dessert that's bound to make a big hit orange and date cup. Just dissolve one package of orange jello in one pint of hot water and then chill. Arrange two thirds of a cup of cut up oranges and two thirds of a cup of chopped dates and sherbet glasses. When the jello is slightly thickened, pour it over the fruit and chill until firm. It's refreshing and zestful, while the whole family will certainly enjoy it. So try orange and date cups soon to add that springtime touch to your menus. Order jello tomorrow from your dealer, but be sure you get the real thing genuine jello. Look for the big red letters on the box. Last number of the 28th program in the new Jello series, and we'll be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. And I want to thank George Burns and Gracie Allen for dropping in on us this evening. Also, to wish them lots of luck on their new series of broadcasts from Grape for Grape Nuts over the same network starting tomorrow night. See your local paper for announcement of time. And uh, I hope to see all of my Los Angeles friends at the annual radio editor show at the Shrine Auditorium next Saturday night. Oh, Jack. What? <laughs> What's funny about that? We laugh when Gracie did it. Good night, Paul. Good night. J E L L O. This is the Red Network of the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs>